Hey everyone, good afternoon. I have to be kind of ninja fast. This is a spontaneous Facebook Live that I wasn't planning on, but this was something that God was really bringing up today. And it's kind of a random topic that I haven't heard taught on very much, but I wanted to really dive into this topic on don't be a quote unquote Job's friend in the lives of your friends and loved ones. Amen. And so I really want to break that down um, today. And again, I'm going to kind of keep this moving super fast because I got to get out the door here in a second. But I did want to hop on and talk about this topic out of the book of Job today. And what I'm going to do while people are kind of hopping on is to kind of give you a summary so that I can really dive into the specific scriptures as we go that I want to hit. Okay. So if we start off in Job chapter one, basically what we learn is that Job is this really upstanding guy who fears God. A lot of us know the basics behind the story of Job, but I want to kind of go through context before we hit more of the nitty gritty behind this teaching today. Okay. All right. So Job is a really, really good guy. It says specifically that he feared God and shunned evil in his personal life. Okay. Um, and we can see that Job initially led this really, really blessed life. He really did. And so we see that Job had all of this different livestock. He, you know, was a really good businessman for back in the time, it seems like. And he had a very prosperous lifestyle. Not only on the business side, he had a bunch of kids. You know, he had a very blessed family. It didn't seem like Job had a lot of health problems. And so all in all, we saw that Job, you know, as a result of putting God first in his personal life, was really walking in a place of blessing. Amen. And so then we learn down the line that part of the reason that Job was walking in this place of blessing is because God had a hedge of protection, as the Bible says, around Job and his family. Amen. That's really, really important for where we're going next. Okay. So that's kind of the beginning of this first chapter in Job. And then we read a little bit farther down in the book of Job. And it says, um, the Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? Satan said, from going to and fro, walking back and forth in the earth. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth. He is a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 9, it says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, you see how Satan is kind of challenging God here? It says, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and surely he will curse you to your face. So Satan is basically saying, there's no man that if you afflicted him, you know, that he wouldn't curse you. You know, Job's not that righteous. And yet God knew Job's heart from the beginning. And he said, this is a man who's truly after my heart. This is someone who I can trust. This is someone who I can get the glory off of his life. Amen. And so basically... God said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. And so we see that Job, and I'm going to speed this up a little bit just for time's sake so we can get to the scriptures that I want to get to today. Um, but we see that Job basically goes through a series of really unfortunate events that Satan brings against him in his personal life. Okay, So we see that you know his kids were killed. That's one of the big things that happens. You know, all of his kids were wiped out all at once. Can you imagine all of the parents out there, if this happened to your kids, imagine how devastating that in itself would be. You know, losing one child, even that is crazy traumatic, but losing all of your kids at once, can you imagine the pain, you know, that Job would have been going through with all of this? So we've got heartbreak over here, right? So we're definitely experiencing heartbreak. But then Satan comes after his finances. And, you know, all of this attack comes against his livestock, his livelihood, all of this stuff. So we've got a second major area of attack where Satan comes in and is just pelting Job with all of this stuff. Then we have a third major area of attack. And basically, he is afflicted with sickness. So, you know, it kind of happens in cycles here that we see in the Bible where Job gets hit with something really major. And then right after that, he gets hit with something really major again. And then he gets hit with a final thing again. And then Job is even surrounded by people who are doing nothing to help him in this situation. Amen. Job's wife has the audacity to look at him and she says, curse God and die. Just do it. And Job is looking at her like, are you kidding, woman? 
how many of you guys are, you know, <laughs> like I do not want to be yoked to a person like that. Amen. We want somebody who's going to encourage us in the Lord in hard times, right? And yet this woman is sitting here and talking to Job and going, you just need to curse God. You know, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to curse the one person who is there to help us through hard times. Amen. And he tries to get you to turn on God in times of hardship because he knows if you will turn on God, you know, your odds of running to him for help are going to be significantly less. Amen. And so anyway, we see this whole horrible situation that Job is walking through. I cannot even imagine. And so basically after all of this happens, um, Job kind of rebukes her and says, you're talking foolishly, woman. Quit this nonsense, right? And he's the one who's being afflicted. I mean, I'm sure that his wife was hit as well. She's just lost her kid. She's in a lot of pain as well. And it was probably the pain talking, you know, but Job's response was better than hers. Amen. Can we have some truth talk today? All right. And so it's basically what I want to focus on more today, now that we know this backstory, is really to focus on Job's friends and the impact that they had, okay? And some things that they probably did pretty well and some things that were not so hot that God actually criticized them for later on in the book of Job. And I want to tell you how we as Christians can sometimes fall into some bad habits and act like Job's friends in the Bible if we are not really, really careful, okay? And it comes from a place of judgment. Christians can be some of the worst, and I say this in love because I've acted like it too before, <laughs> about judging other people when they're going through a hard time and when they're in hard circumstances and assuming certain things about people and not reacting well in times of where other people are suffering in a place of hardship and reacting kind of in a puffed up prideful place without even realizing it. And so today I want to talk about humility. I want to talk about what a right reaction is. You know, if you have someone in your life that needs support that has just been through a hard season and how we should approach hard times ourselves. Amen. And so Basically, we see that Job has three friends. So this is, we're going to chapter two now, because I kind of flew through chapter one for time's sake to give you a summary. So we're in chapter two now, and let's start in verse 11, okay? It says, now when Job's three friends heard of all of this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shunite, and Zophar the Naamite. For they had made an appointment together and come to mourn with him and to comfort him, okay? So let's pause. Let's not demonize or make Job's friends out to be horrible right from the get-go. They had heard that Job had been through this incredible crisis in his life, and they were come to, coming to see him to try to help, right? Those are pretty awesome friends to begin with, right? We shouldn't just turn up our nose at these guys, you know, ahead of time. They probably didn't have a bad heart motive towards Job, right? Okay. And so I think a lot of times we go, oh, bad Job's friends when we read the book of Job. But you've got to understand they came in, you know, trying to comfort him. They came in trying to help him from their perspective, right? So they came in to try to comfort him. Going to verse 12, it says, And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Okay, pause. Up until this point, that's pretty awesome friends, it would seem like, right? How many of you guys have friends that would sit with you for seven days and seven nights and just be there to support you when you're in a time of terrible crisis? Some of you guys might, if you're a part of a really good church community or if you've got some really good friends. But for a lot of people, they don't have that in their lives, right? So up until this point, we see that Job's friends are not doing half bad, right? You know, they're trying to support him. They came as soon as they heard there was a sign of trouble and they're hanging out and they're trying to encourage Job and they haven't said a bunch of dumb stuff yet, right? They're just kind of hanging out, being quiet, you know, being a support for him in his life, okay? So then Job kind of opens up his mouth for the first time. That's this whole speech that we hear in chapter three. And basically he talks about why was I even Born, you know, he just starts questioning things and he's not accusing God of wrong, but he's just, you know, he's processing this place of grief that of course all of us would be in if we had just gone through this circumstance, just like Job had been through, right? And so we see kind of this dialogue that is going on in Job's heart where he's just crying out of this place of pain and he's confused, right? I'm sure all of us would be confused if these circumstances happened to us as well when everything was going great, you know, our lives were looking really good and then all of a sudden and out of nowhere everything in our lives it felt like came crashing down of course you would be confused of course you'd have questions right and so we see job is really in this processing mode and he says this phrase he says for the thing that i greatly feared 
has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. Can you imagine what a shockingly awful place that would feel like? The thing that you feared the most has come upon you and you're just sitting there in the middle of it. Some of you guys have lived this in different ways before in your personal life, right? Where the enemy came in like a flood in your life and you're just sitting there trying to look at how to pick up the pieces of that storm, that disaster, that heartbreak that hit your life. And you're going, God, what do I do with this, right? A lot of us have been in that place before, even if it's slightly different circumstances than what Job had been through, right? And so then we see that Job's first friend comes onto the scene. And he starts giving this um, speech to Job. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to hop over a couple chapters here. And I want to look out a few of the specific phrases that the friends are kind of bantering off at Job. And how this can get into dangerous territory for us in our lives as a Christian, okay? So they went from a place that wasn't half bad. They were sitting with Job, you know, they were trying to comfort him. They had come there to support him. And then we see that their attitudes kind of get off into a little bit of a sketchy territory, right? They started to try to reason in their own mind what could have caused these activities and this horrible stuff to happen to Job. And so in their own minds, they started to try to justify it in their own strength and in their own reasoning of the why behind why all of this was happening to Job. So on the surface, it seems like what they're doing wouldn't be that bad, right? Like if you read these scriptures in Job, and I'd encourage you guys to, if you haven't been through the book of Job in a while, go look at it. Because a lot of what they're saying is God is right, God is just, God is pure, you know? And they they seem like they're really saying all these phrases that are exalting God, but they're also coming in and doing some stuff that is really not good, and that's what I want us to look at today. You know what it kind of reminds me of is that spirit of divination and Python spirit in the Bible. You guys remember when that um, fortune teller girl that was coming up against the Apostle Paul was in the New Testament and she was proclaiming and causing a big distraction in the crowd and she was saying, these men are telling the truth, listen to them. You know, it seemed like on the surface she was saying all of the right things, but the heart was not in the right place and it was causing distraction, it was causing all this stuff and eventually the Apostle Paul got fed up and he cast the demon out of her. Amen. And so we've got to look kind of behind the scenes, ladies and gents, about what's really going on a lot of the time in these stories, okay? And that's why you need the context of the whole Bible a lot of the time to really see patterns and to really dive deeper into this. And we really need the Holy Spirit to help us as we are reading scripture. Amen? Okay, so let's keep going. Um, So one of Job's friends said this specific phrase to him, and this is in Job 5, verse 17. He said, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastising of the Almighty. Okay? Now, let's pause and talk about this because context is critical here. You know, God does correct us. And, you know, God, we specifically hear in Scripture that God disciplines those that he loves. Right? You know, God, if it's going to cause us to go into a place of harm or danger, or if we are involved in sinful behavior, of course God's going to discipline us. Right? But in the context of what Job had just been through, what the the context is here is this friend was accusing Job of having done something really wrong in his personal life. And he was almost acting like, well, Job, you deserved all of this misfortune, you know? And he's kind of coming in with this accusatory manner towards Job. And he's really going in at a time of severe heartbreak and severe trial in Job's life. And he's trying to reason through the facts in his brain of why all of this could have come about. And, you know, he's kind of really laying into Job. So we see in this circumstance that Job's friend is really attacking him here, okay? Um, So we hear Job's response later on down the line. There's a lot more that I could read you in that whole passage, but for time's sake, we're going to move forward a little bit. So if we hop to chapter 6, we see that Job's response back to the friend is this, starting in verse 14. It says, To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook. All right, so Job is laying into his friend, and he's going, is this helpful? Like, I am in the worst pain of my entire life. Is this helpful, right? Let's keep going. I want to hop down to verse 22. He said, did I ever say bring something to me or offer a bribe for me with your wealth or deliver me from my enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of the oppressors? Teach me and I'll hold my tongue. He's going, you know what? Show me what I did. I'll hold my tongue. He's going, cause me to understand wherein I have erred. All right. So he's saying, if I've messed up, show me. 
like, show me what I did, show me what's wrong, and I'll be quiet in this situation. But he goes, you're just accusing me when you don't know the full story behind my life and what has been going on. He says, do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one, which are of as the wind? Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless and you undermine your friends. Yes, concede my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? So Job is going right back at him and he's going, you know what? If I've legit done something wrong, I'm open to that. I'm honest to that. But you're doing a whole lot of assuming in my life and my circumstances. And you're coming at me in a time when I'm in a place of hardship. I'm in a place of pain in my personal life. And you are coming at me like I am just this horrible, horrible person. And Job is just really coming against these friends for laying into him, right? You know, I think that as Christians, a lot of the time, I have seen the Christian community get so judgmental and so into a place of assumption and say things that are super unhelpful to people who are in a time of mourning, okay? Let me give you an example that I hear a lot in the Christian community. Let's say that um, someone had a close friend or family member pass away and they're at the funeral for that person. I have heard people say things like, oh, well, God just needed another angel in heaven. That's not helpful. That is so insensitive, you guys. <laughs> like that's, and I hear this stuff all the time, you know, or I, a big one that I hear a lot of the time is Christians will accuse other Christians of being in a massive place of sin just because they're facing hardship in their personal life. And that isn't always the case, ladies and gentlemen. I see this specifically a lot, you know, like if someone gets sick in their personal life. You know, sometimes the reason that people get sick is simply because we live in a fallen world. Now, is that to say that sin doesn't sometimes factor into the equation behind us going through hard circumstances? Of course not. Sometimes we are going through hardship because we did embrace a place of sin, but not always. And so often Christians are the worst at looking at a family member's situation, looking at a friend's situation, and going off of the limited facts and data that they know surrounding a current circumstance, and then getting into an accusatory manner against another person and going, well, obviously God's not wrong. And so you must be the reason that your circumstances are so horrible. And guys, that's just not cool, okay? Like what that person needs in that moment when they're going through a place of hardship is they need someone to sit with them. They need someone to be a friend. They need someone to pray for them. They need someone to just be there to help them. Amen. And so this is really, really critical. Um, okay, so let's keep going here a little bit because I want you to see a little bit more. Okay. Um, so then we see um, in chapter 8 that Bildad starts to have his little, you know, interaction. This is another one of Job's friends. It says, does God subvert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. If you would earnestly seek God and make supplication to the Almighty, if you were actually pure and upright, Surely now he would awake for you and prosper you for your rightful dwelling place. Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly, okay? So what's, what's a big problem here is this guy is purely equating a Christian's works to their prosperity in their personal life. Did you guys catch that? And this is what so many Christians can get in a place of if we're not careful, is we can assume that whether we're blessed in our lives or we're not blessed in our lives is purely because of our works, amen? And, you know, this is where that works by salvation stuff can try to creep into a Christian's life if you aren't careful, ladies and gents. And, yes, if you're staying away from a place of sin in your personal life, 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to walk in more blessing, right? That's why God warns us about a place of sin. But so often we accuse people who are walking through a place of hardship, of it being their own fault when we don't know the full story behind the scenes, okay? So basically this voice that is coming through Job's friend is a place of accusation. He tried to say this. He said, if God really saw you as being in good standing in your personal life, that you would automatically be walking in a place of prosperity. And I'm gonna tell you guys, that is not always the case, okay? Look at the um, disciples in the Bible. You know, sometimes Christians go through persecution and they're doing exactly what God has called them to do. Can we have some truth talk today? Yes, God wants you walking in a blessed life, but you know what? The disciples, most of them, 
were killed for their faith. They were martyred for their faith. So to say that you're never going to face any hard circumstances in your personal life as a Christian or never go through anything is completely false, ladies and gents. You know, sometimes, you you know, God is very pleased with you when you're walking through a hard time. Amen. And so we've got to be really careful not to assume where other people are coming from or what their situations are without knowing all of the facts. And, you know, we've got to be willing to come in with an attitude of humility ourselves. And rather than accusing them of being wrong, of saying, God, help me to take the plank out of my own eye first. Help me to check myself. And God, I pray for them. I'll pray for them. And God, I pray that you would expose what you need to. And if there's something they need to act on, show us, you know, but so often we go into these situations and we, you know, accuse people based on their works of whether or not they're in good standing with God. You know, I want to go back to this whole, um, <laughs> being judgmental towards them in a time of pain concept. Okay. So in John nine, three, basically what we learned from Jesus himself was that sometimes the reason that someone is suffering with a sickness has nothing to do with sin in their personal life. Sometimes it does, you know, but not all the time. So in John 9, 3, it says, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Okay, ladies and gents, so all of that to say, we are not God, okay? We don't know the full backstory. We don't know a lot of what's going on in circumstances, which is why it's so important for us to humble ourselves in a good place before we go in and we try to attack or assume things about other people. Okay, so we see that his friends are still continuing to kind of lay into Job over this situation. Let's hop to Job 8, verse 20 through 22. It says, Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. And so, you know what, it sounds like they're saying all kinds of good things, but again, the underlying kind of a thing here is if you were really in good standing with God, this hard stuff would not be happening to you. Amen? And so, we've, we've got to really be careful, okay? All right. Um, so, let me read you a little bit more, and then I want to hop to the end of the book of Job here, okay? So, this is Job chapter 11, verses 13. We're going to start there. It says, if you would, oh, and backstory, this is Job's friend talking. Um, I want to be sure to preface because I'm hopping around a lot. It says, If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands towards him, if iniquity were in your hand and you put it far away and would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, did you guys catch that? Then you could surely lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and do not fear because you would forget your misery and remember it as waters that had passed away. So you see, again, that accusatory tone coming through in this friend's, you know, attitude and demeanor towards Job. He says, if you wouldn't have let wickedness into your life, then you could lift your face up without spot. Then you wouldn't be going through any hardship in your personal life. And so he's really, really, again, these friends are just coming into Job, right? And so then we see in verse, in chapter 12, that Job answers his critics again. You know, he answers the people who are coming after him. And then I want to hop to the end of Job. Okay, so Job is doing a lot of questioning of God throughout the book of Job, and he's really asking God a lot about his circumstances, right? Um, and so if we hop through here, and I'm using my Bible Bible today. Sometimes I use the computer and pull up um, the Bible, but today I wanted to have my hands on my actual Bible. So give me a second as I'm flipping here. Um, so let's hop to the very end of the book of Job. All right, so basically... Um, Job, God challenges Job at the end of the book of Job. Those of you guys who are very familiar with the story remember this part. And the Lord said in verse uh, chapter 40 and verse 6, he said, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And what that represents is the storm that's going on in his life. Okay. And, you know, here's the interesting part. Did you guys notice when Job first got afflicted with all of these horrible trials and tribulations in his life, God was silent for a while? You know, the teacher is often silent during a test in our personal lives. Amen. And so God was silent for a little bit. And then suddenly, you know, he spoke right before Job was about to get delivered from this stuff. You guys following me today? And so if God needs to bring correction into somebody's life, God's going to step into that situation. And he's going to have a say, ladies and gents. 
Amen. And so God is standing up and he's about to have this very needed conversation with Job. And so in verse six, it says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God or can you thunder with a voice like his? And you can see it's very powerful language. I'm not going to read all of this to you guys, but I'd encourage you to go read it. And basically, God is coming in strong with his tone towards Job, right? And basically, the whole premise of God's message towards Job is, do you know everything? Do you understand? You're acting like you understand the full extent of what's going on right now. And he's going, you know, are you God? Basically, it's his whole message to Job. He's going, are you God? And so you talk about getting humbled really, really fast in this situation, right? And so basically, God just talks about all the wonders, you know, how he created the earth, all this different stuff, how he sees everything, how he watches over everything. And this is Job's response in chapter 42. It says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? You see that? So that was, you know, the Lord's response to Job. And he goes, you know what? You don't have the full knowledge of what's going on. You know, you're not God. You need to trust me, Job. Amen. And he says, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Listen to me. God knows how to bring correction into people's lives even more than you could ever do that. Amen. And, you know, so often we go into situations, guns blazing against people and things that are going on. But we have no idea the full backstory. And we are just judging things based on the surface and putting ourselves in positions that we have no right to be in. Amen. Let's keep going. All right. Verse 7. It says, And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite. Remember, that's one of the friends we're talking about today. My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. You see how even when Job is in this time of extreme distress, God stands up for him in that circumstance. How powerful is that, ladies and gents? He's going, you guys were all about accusing Job, but I knew what was really going on behind the scenes. And Job, even in the midst of his distress, even in all his questioning, even in all of these hard times that he went through, he still did not lift his voice against me. I want to head back to the very beginning of the book of Job and read you a phrase that's critical. In Job chapter 1, verse 22, it says, In all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Amen. That's powerful. Ladies and gents, I don't know about you guys, but I hope I would be able to have that patience if something that hard happened to me in my life. But I want to tell you, a lot of Christians would fail this test. Amen? And so we see God, even though he still was kind of correcting Job to say, you know what, I'm still God and I'm still in control of your life. I know you've got questions. I know there's stuff going on. You know, now he's dealing very strongly with Job's friends and fighting for Job in this situation. Okay? All right? He says, uh, verse 8, Now therefore take up for yourself seven bulls and seven rams. Go um, to my servant Job and offer up yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Okay. So in other words, the friends, when they were getting puffed up in this place of pride in their personal lives, what they didn't realize is they were also speaking against God in some different areas. So I would encourage you to go read through. So what it sounded like they were saying all kinds of good things, right? It sounded like they were saying, you know, God is great. God is good. God's in charge of all this stuff. But in reality, their heart stance was not in the right place. Okay, so let's keep going. It says, um, so Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shunite and Zophar the Namite went and did as the Lord commanded them. For the, as the Lord had accepted, for the Lord had accepted Job. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he had prayed for his friends. And here's what I love about the end of this story. It says, Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. Then all his brothers, all his sisters, and all those who had been acquaintances before came to him, ate food with him at his house, and they consoled him and comforted him and ate uh, for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a ring of gold. 
here's the other part I love about this. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job's life more than the beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. In all the land there were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And the father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And then it talks about how Job lived a very, very long life of an old age, and he died when he was at an old age, okay? So all of that to say, God is more than able to bring justice into situations that are going on. But I want to go back to the initial premise of this whole teaching is don't be a Job's friend in these circumstances. So often we assume the worst of people when they are going through trials or tribulations. We try to rationalize different things, whether it's a close family member, a close friend, all of this stuff. When in reality, we need, just need to be supportive of people who are going through a hard time. You know, we need to not try to, you know, talk through things that we don't understand. And we just need to be there for them. Amen. And so all of that to say, I've seen a lot of Christians who can fall into this. And, you know, they don't realize that they're coming from a place of pride a lot of the time. And that's why God so strongly rebukes Job's friends. They acted like they knew everything. And God's like, no, you do not know the full backstory behind this story. Amen. So I just want to encourage you guys to be very, very careful with that today. Hope you guys have a fantastic day and I'll chat with you soon.